What up, YouTube? It's now the self determination. Back with at you guys with um, some more Black History every day. Today is February the seventeenth, and in 1938, February 17th, Mary Frances Barry, first woman to to serve as chancellor of a major research university, University of Colorado, is born in Nashville, Tennessee. So I'll go ahead and get into some of the life of Mary Frances ba Barry. Mary Frances Berry, born February 17, 1938, is the Geraldine R. Siegel Professor of American Social Thought and Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania and the former chairwoman of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. She is also the former board chair of Pacifica Radio. Excuse me. She is a past president of the Organization of American Historians, the primary professional organization for historians of the United States. At Penn, Barry teaches American legal history. Before coming to Penn, Barry was provost, provost of the College of Behavioral and Social Science at University of Maryland, College Park, and chancellor of the University of Colorado at Boulder. She received her PhD and JD degrees from the University of Michigan. I'm actually curious about the JD degrees. Oh, Juris Doctor. Oh, okay. Also known as Doctor of Jurisprudence degree. Okay, I didn't know that. For the University of Michigan. Okay, now, born, Barry was born yeah, in Nashville, Tennessee. She was the second of three children of George and Francis Barry. Because of economic hardship and family circumstances, she and her older brother were placed in an orphanage for a time. Barry attended Nashville segregated schools, graduating with honors from high school, and attending Fisk University in Nashville, where her primary interests were philosophy, history, and chemistry. Barry transferred to Howard University, where she received her bachelor's degree. Following this, Barry studied at the University of Michigan, received a Ph.D. in history from the University of Michigan, and a J.D. from the University of Michigan Law School. Barry spent the next six years working at the University of Maryland, eventually becoming the interim provost of the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences. In 1976, she became chancellor of the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado the first black woman to head a major research university. In 1977, Barry took a leave of absence from the University of Colorado when President Jimmy Carter named her Assistant Secretary for Education in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. According to Paul Glastris, in one speech, Barry embarrassed the Carter administration by praising major aspects of the ed education system in communist China. Glastris offers two other non contemporaneous examples of bolster, I'm sorry, to bolster his argument that Barry's views did not reflect a, quote, monetary flight of harmless cultural relativism, end quote. Both from a book Barry co-wrote in 1982 with John Blassingame, Long Memory, The Black Experience in America, is the name of the book. In one instance, they describe great society efforts to promote family planning in black ghettos, quote, Although most historians have dismissed the claims of Afro-Americans that the United States had inaugurated a, a campaign of genocide against black people in the 1960s as unfounded hysterical charges, the threat of genocide was real. It was roughly comparable to the threat faced by Jews in the 1930s, end quote, regarding America's black blacks lack of interest in communism in the 1920s and 1930s, Barry M. Blassingame wrote, quote, subjected to a massive barrage of propaganda from American news media, few of them knew about Russia's constitutional safeguards for minorities, the extent of equal opportunity or the equal provision of social services to its citizens, end quote. Now, in my opinion, um, Miss Barry, Miss Mary Frances Barry, she uh, was a very outspoken woman and a person who was willing to advocate for women's rights along with black and or African-American rights. Um, her ideas and her thoughts were not were not smiled upon or not looked at with high regard when it comes to the um, the masses or the people who are in control of the status quo. I mean, the, the white majority. Let's just let's just say it. You know, she spoke the truth. She wasn't worried about being liberal with her words. She wasn't worried about being um, politically correct. She put she paint th painted things in the. the she shed the light on things that needed light shed on. She painted the pictures that people needed to see. She wasn't going to soft shoe around around certain topics. She cared about her people and she cared about the state 
and the plight of her people in America and possibly around the world. And she wasn't going to let other people dumb down her work or her words. Mind you, this woman has a PhD in history. She has a PhD in history. You know? So I think that a person like this who is who is unapologetic about putting out there the 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 the, the disparities in, in in all the wrongs that happen against black people in this country, we need more people like that, in my opinion. Anyway, I'll continue. In 1980, Barry left the Department of Education to return to Howard University as a professor of history and law. Carter appointed her to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, where during her tenure, she became involved in legal battles with Carter's successor, Ronald Reagan. And, you know, thanks to Reagan, we got Reaganomics, you know, the, in, the uh, influx of crack cocaine into the black communities and Oliver North, you know, working covertly with the CIA and the um, Nicaraguan Contras to bring the cocaine into the country. Yeah. When Reagan attempted to remove her from the board, she successfully went to court to keep her seat. She clashed frequently with the commission with on the commission with the uh, Reagan appointed chairman, Clarence M. Pendleton Jr., a fellow African-American and a former swimming coach at Howard University. Pendleton tried to move the commission in line with Reagan's social and civil rights views and arouse the, the ire of liberals and feminists. He served from 1981 until his sudden death in 1988. In 1984, Barry co-founded the Free South Africa Movement, dedicated to the abolition of apartheid in South Africa. She was one of three prominent Americans arrested at the South African Embassy in Washington the day before Thanksgiving. The time was deliberated. The timing was deliberate. I'm sorry to ensure maximum news exposure. And the Free South Africa Movement was a coalition of individuals, organizations, students, and unions across the United States of America who sought to end apartheid in South Africa with local branches throughout the country. It was primarily anti-apartheid. It was, I'm sorry, the primary anti-apartheid movement in the United States. And also, for those who didn't know, Castro um, actually helped Nelson Mandela fight against apartheid in South Africa, for those who didn't know. So maybe he wasn't necessarily the monster that America would like you to believe he was. In any event, I digress. In 1987, Barry took a tenured chair at the University of Pennsylvania while continuing to serve on the Civil Rights Commission. In 1993, Barry's book, The Politics of Parenthood, Child Care, Women's Rights, and The Myth of the Good Mother was published. Receiving the book in the Christian Science Monitor, Laura Van Tuyo, I believe, sorry, T-U-Y-L, stated, Quote, Barry presents a dispassionate history of the women's movement, daycare, and home life, showing the persistent obstacles to economic and political power that have confronted women as a result of society's definition of them as mothers, end quote. Her heavily footnoted chrono I'm sorry, chronology attributes the failures of the Equal Rights Amendment and languishing of the women's movement in the 80s and years of bickering over federal parental leave and child care bills to an unwillingness to rethink gender roles, end quote. Let's see. Separately from her work on the Civil Rights Commission, Barry was named chair of the Pacifica Radio Foundation's National Board on June 1997. In June 1997, I, said, I should say. She grew great controversy from listeners, programmers, and station staff after she and the board attempted to modify programming in order to expand the listeners of the stations to attract a more diverse audience. Quote, white male hippies over 50, end quote. It's how Barry described the programmers and audience of KPFA in Berkeley. Rumors of board actions involving the sale of flagship stations such as KPFA were widely circulated by the programmers. And this is what I mean about uh, Miss Barry. She worked for that radio station and she wanted, she, she wanted the content on the radio station to actually reach more than just white, white middle-aged men. And what is wrong with that? What is wrong with her wanting to actually, you know, have the, 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 the organization she works for reach people that look like her. Everything in this country can't be based on what middle-aged white men want. It can't be because there's more, there are more people in this country just old-ass white men. I apologize for that. There are more people in this country than just old white men. And that's a fact. Miss, Miss, Francis, Miss Mary Frances Berry vision to expand the listening audience to include other people was not a bad idea. So I'll read on. This is from another site and I'll leave um, 
the links to these different sites into in the uh, description box so you guys can look up more information on um, Miss Mary Frances Berry as well on your own. To describe Mary Frances Berry as a liberal, as she is frequently referred to in the media, is an insult to liberalism and Berry. She is a political radical well outside the mainstream of American politics. She is unabashed in her support of out and out racial quote, quotas with no effort to disguise them in the kinder, gentler terms of quote unquote affirmative action or quote unquote diversity. She has described family planning clinics in the inner cities as an effort at, genoc at genocide of blacks. She has said that absent affirmative action colleges and universities, I'm sorry, she said that absent affirmative action colleges and universities would be dominated by almost nothing but Jews and Asians. And these are some of the things that white America did not like that she said, which is true. There are numbers, not scores of black people who believe that Planned Parenthood and these family, these family planning clinics in black communities is part of genocide. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, um, Planned Parenthood is the child of Nazi Germany because it was German, it was German um, scientists after World War II that America, you know, quote unquote, took captive and brought over here to work for America that actually started Planned Parenthood. You know, I mean, there's a pattern that has been formed in this country where the majority have been, have uh, done a number of things to pretty much keep their foot on the throats of black people in this country. You know, and I'm just speaking this because this is where the information has taken me. This isn't a conspiracy or this isn't a, this isn't a theory of a conspiracy. If you look at the history of this country and how it has affected the lives of black people, you'll see that also. So I'll continue. So how did a woman with such objectionable views ever end up on the Civil Rights Commission, much less stay there for nearly two and a half decades? President Carter appointed her to a small, largely toothless agency initially in 1980 in order not to keep her at the newly created education department. President Reagan fired her from the agency shortly after I became director, but an ensuing court battle and media frenzy inspired Congress to rewrite the law, giving Congress then control entirely by Democrats authority to appoint half the commission's members, members ensuring her reappointment. And President Clinton elevated her, elevated, sorry, her to chairman in part to appease her after he passed over the commission and named an entirely new advisory body to engage in what he called a, quote, national dialogue on race, end quote. Um, let's see. There's a, this woman has done a lot. There's a lot of information on her. Now that, let's see. Now that Barry is gone, the commission can get back to its original purpose, monitoring the enforcement of civil rights laws, especially the Voting Rights Act conducting high quality research on civil rights and reporting to the president, Congress and the public on the status of race relations in, in the United States, but not actually attacking and combating race issues, just writing down and documenting incidents of, 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 of race and then reporting it, not actually fighting against it. Or like I said, monitoring the and monitoring the enforcement of civil rights laws. I mean, civil rights laws can be monitored all they want you can monitor them all they want but if no one cares to enforce them then they won't be enforced right reporting on those things doesn't necessarily mean that you have to actually enforce them anyway um let's see want to read a little bit more on um miss barry let's see let's see barry preserved preserved in her studies in the segregated schools of nashville I'm sorry, persevered, I apologize. Barry persevered in her studies in the segregated schools of Nashville and eventually found a mentor, Minerva Hawkins, one of the black teachers at her high school. At the time, Barry was in the 10th grade, both with school and experiencing the usual uncertainties that come with adolescence. Hawkins challenged her to keep learning and growing so that she could one day reach her full potential. While Barry had someone with whom she could discuss academic subjects and her plans for the future, she also had the encouragement and support of her mother, who was determined to provide better opportunities for her children. Barry recalled in Miss in um what Miss or MS that her mother would say, quote, you, Mary Francis, you're smart. You can think. You can do all the things I, I would have done if I if it had been possible for me. 
You have a responsibility to use your mind and to go as far as it will take you, end quote. In 1956, Beverly succeeded in making herself her mother and her mentor proud by graduating with honors from Pearl High School. Let's see, I already said that philosophy, history, and chemistry were her main areas of interest. Berry then decided to leave Howard University and continue her graduate studies in the University of Michigan. Already read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1980, President Carter appointed Berry to the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights, a bipartisan agency that monitors the enforcement of civil rights laws. Along with Berry, he appointed Belinda Cardenas Ramirez and commissioned a massive affirmative action study. In doing so, Carter planted, quote, many seeds that would later grow to entangle the commission in turmoil under President Ronald Reagan, end quote, theorized James Russell Jr. in Rolling Stone. When the affirmative action study was published, it supported setting goals and timetables for correcting historic discrimination of blacks and women, particularly in the workplace. In his 1980 presidential campaign, Reagan had spoken against affirmative action, and the newly published study put him in an uncomfortable position. According to Reston, the Commission on Civil Rights was viewed by Reagan and his staff as a quote, as quote, a pocket of renegades that needed to be cleaned out, end quote. So do you understand, do you guys understand that? When, when, when people look at history and look at the, our country and look at the way it's ran and operated and how black people are treated and or mistreated, they're considered, they're considered renegades. They're considered, you know, they, they, they're considered, you know, a uh, 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 dangerous people when you actually see things and call them what they are and you don't sugarcoat them with liberal terms and or um or uh jargon or or any or anything such as though anything such as that you're, you're considered an outlaw you're considered somebody who is who has gone rogue you're considered a threat because you're actually telling the truth because apparently America seems to um, operate under the assumption, and Hitler actually said this, you tell a lie loud enough and long enough, people will eventually begin to believe it. And America has done that for centuries now. For centuries. Um, let's see. I'll continue. on. I'll read this a little bit more, and then I'll cut this video short. Because, I don't, again, I don't want to make these videos too long. I just want to introduce you all to these um, individuals so that you can understand how important they are to history and the history of our people especially when it comes to being black in America. Let's see. Um, okay, in the Washington Post, Barry expressed her frustration over Reagan's attempt to remove members of the commission who disagreed with his viewpoints. She felt that his actions reduced the U.S. Civil Rights Commission from, quote-unquote, watchdog of civil rights to a, quote-unquote, a lap dog for the administration. Barry and Ramirez successfully sued Reagan in a federal court and retained their seats on the commission. Barry became known as, quote unquote, the woman the president could not fire. John Barthel wrote to, um, wrote in MS that Barry's, quote, convictions kept her clinging stubbornly to her outcast's seat on the commission, end quote. Barry responded, I tell my friends the happiest day of my life was when Reagan fired me. I was fired because I did what I was supposed to do. His Pardon me. His firing me was like giving me an A and saying, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go to the head of the class. End quote. Stepped up the role in global activism. Academic analysis comprised only one part of Barry's professional life. In 1984, she wanted to raise the collective American consciousness on apartheid in South Africa. The issue of South Africa's government imposed policy of racial segregation was being discussed by groups throughout the United States, but little action, I'm sorry, but little was actually being done to end it. Barry felt that it was time to take action. On Thanksgiving Eve of 1984, Barry, Trans-Africa head Ronald Robinson and Congresswoman, I'm sorry, Congressman Walter Fontroy visited the South African Embassy in Washington, D.C. and presented a list of demands. They wanted longtime political prisoner Nelson Mandela of the, Na the African National Congress, as well as other anti-apartheid leaders, set free, and they wanted a new South Africa African Constitutional Conference plan. The three activists vowed that they would wait while the ambassador called uh, Pretoria, the seat of the country's government, with their demands. Their actions had been carefully planned for what is traditionally a slow news day, as Barry told MS. If, quote, if you're going to help people in their struggle, 
you should you should be smart for them. If your demonstration doesn't get media coverage, coverage, you might as well not have it, end quote. The media was indeed there to record Barry Robinson and Fauntroy being handcuffed and led away in a paddy wagon. The effect was just what the trio had hoped for. Barthel recounted in MS, quote, Here was not just another campus radical. Here was Dr. Mary Frances Barry, a member of the Commission on Civil Rights, a professor of history and law, a member of the bar, a scholar with published books to her credit, with more citations and honorary degrees than her wall could hold. Here was a former assistant secretary of health, education, and welfare, once a provost at the University of Maryland and chancellor at the University of Colorado at Boulder, end quote. This woman is a freedom fighter. This woman is a freedom fighter, and she was not afraid to speak her mind, stand up, and or speak for her people. And this is what we need more of. We need more people like that. Our ancestors were stronger than what we are now. They were way stronger than what we are now. Because while black people nowadays are so busy trying to say and do the right things as to not make white people angry, our ancestors didn't have the luxury of being afraid. They didn't care because they knew what they were saying was right. They knew what was happening was wrong. And they knew that they had to stand up and fight for us because nobody else would. This is why learning about our history is so important. Because if we continue to forget about those who came before us and fought for us, what are we left with? What examples do we have to go into the future and continue their work if we allow other people to overshadow our history and our ancestors who fought, who fought to death, a lot of them, so that we can have a voice to stand up and speak for ourselves? What good does it do to not study your history? To allow somebody else to paint the picture of who the picture of who you are for you instead of you painting the own picture, your own picture and telling your own story. But that's all I have for right now. I'm going to step down off my soapbox. And um, in this video, this is not a self-determination. Like, learn and subscribe. Tomorrow is February the 18th and we will have more um, everyday in black history facts for you guys. Stay tuned and peace.